able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. is, with okay. All right. Like I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Public Works Committee of the City of Rapid City for Tuesday, July 10th. And first order of business is roll call and determination of a quorum. Brenda? Drew? Here. Scott? Here. Modric? Here. Roberts? Here. Nordstrom? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next up is the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Nordstrom, second by Modric. All in, um, all in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And the uh, agenda is adopted. Now it's time for general public comment. A time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the committee on any issue not limited to items on the agenda. Action will not be taken at the meeting or on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by unanimous vote of the aldermen present. And I have no general public comments. Is there anyone out there that I'm missing? Okay, seeing none, uh, general public comment is closed. Now we go on to consent items one through five. Public comment is now open on items one through five. We have no comment on one through five from the public, so that's now closed. And now I'd like to hear from uh, the members of the committee to see if they'd like to pull any items from the consent. Uh, Chair recognizes Amanda Scott. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to pull item number five for separate consideration. Number five. Anything else? Seeing none, I would like a motion to approve the remainder of the consent calendar with the exception of five. So moved. Second. Moved by Mordrick, second by Nordstrom. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed, and the motion carries. We'll go on to item number five. Okay, no, uh, number five is from the Solid Waste Division. No bids received. Authorized <coughs> staff to re-advertise for bids for two. 8,000 pound triple stage forklifts. Estimated cost $148,000. We go to Amanda Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may ask Mr. Dale Tech a follow up question on this item, please. Thank yep. you. Um, so, Dale, it's not often that we get no bids received. Could you just give us some background information as far as why we're re advertising these bids? Certainly. Um, when we are acquiring equipment, uh, particularly specialty equipment or something uh, out of the uh, normal realm we need to have good service response when uh, if there's a warranty issue or if the equipment goes down so we've been adding into our bid packages I believe a 48 time or 48 hour time uh, period for the supplier to provide a service to get these pieces of equipment back in operation uh, we believe that that may have led to this item not getting any bids we're going to relook at that uh, also look at the bid specifications to see if there's other things that we can open up to make it more attractive to bidders. Uh, certainly uh, when we buy a significant piece of equipment, we want to make sure that it stays in operation and uh, doesn't slow our operations down. So that's the, that's the reason that uh, we're asking to rebid. We're going to make some slight changes to the bid package and, and re-advertise. Uh, on the purchase of or uh, on the bid of these two um, special forklifts is it are these the only two available that's why you're looking at a 48 hour service plan on it or it, is there availability within the fleet to be able to provide services to expand on that period of these are service? the only two that we would have so currently we have two uh, in service that are have reached the end of their their useful life uh, so it's time to get some replacements and if there are any issues warranty or otherwise we want to make sure that they stay in operation and uh, don't slow us down so you plan on disposing of the two in current use once these are um, absolutely put into use yes active use all right well thank you and good luck on the next bid then so <laughs> we'll be looking for those thank you madam chair chair recognizes Richie Nordstrom thank you madam chair move to uh, have staff re-advertise re for the bids please Motion by Nordstrom, second by Roberts. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And the motion carries. That takes us on to non-consent items, items six and seven. I do have two request uh, forms on item six, and that is a request from MF Properties LLC for a variance to waive the requirement to install a sidewalk per city ordinance 12.08.060 along La Crosse Street for the property located at zero, or 601 East Omaha Street. And Chair recognizes Jerry Foster. Uh, 
Thank you. I'm Jerry Foster with FMG Engineering. We're the civil engineering um, consultant on the Subaru expansion project at the corner of La Crosse and Omaha Street. Um, and we're here today to appeal the staff's recommendation for the sidewalk variance on La Crosse Street between Omaha and the railroad street, or railroad tracks south of Omaha Street. Um, a few points we'd like to make in our appeal um, is first, we are not applying for an exception to not construct sidewalk along East Omaha Street in front of the Subaru site. Um, the property owners of Subaru MF Properties, are, they're, they're good corporate citizens and they realize the sidewalk was needed along Omaha Street. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic there. So they stepped up to the plate, did not appeal, um, to not construct that sidewalk, even though Omaha Street um, was not constructed in anticipation of the sidewalk. So in addition to just the normal sidewalk, they have to do a substantial amount of slope grading on that. And just so you, and we understand economics, costs of sidewalks, are not to be uh, the decision-making process the council looks at on sidewalks. But I would like you to know that that sidewalk along Omaha they're constructing is roughly 740 feet in length, and they're gonna pony up around $35,000 to build that sidewalk. You know, that's not cheap. Um, but again, they're willing to do it. So now on to the, the sidewalk in question along Omaha, or along La Crosse Street. The fundamental issue that, that we have with that is lack of right-of-way. Between the back of the curb and the property line where the sidewalk is needed, there's about seven and a half feet of right-of-way. The sidewalk plus a one-foot separation from the property line is going to take up six feet of that seven and a half feet of right-of-way. We originally proposed a six-foot curbside sidewalk, but the staff is suggesting it should be a property line sidewalk. So that means we have a foot and a half between the sidewalk and the back of the curb. And then the issue with that is there's a private telephone box above grade in that right of way in the middle of it. And there's also a city owned fire hydrant. So in order to build this sidewalk, the telephone box has to be moved. The property owner does not have the authority to order that telephone box to be moved. Um, we're requesting that the city provide the funding to move the fire hydrant in the event you deny our variance request. You know, at, at some point, it just seems like it starts to get unreasonable on what the property owners have to do to build sidewalks. The property owner in this case believes it's unreasonable to ask them to move a city-owned fire hydrant for an after the fact sidewalk construction type of thing. The sidewalk was not, or the, the fire hydrant was not constructed in a manner to allow the sidewalk to be constructed. Um, and we would note there's a sidewalk on the west side of La Crosse Street that provides pedestrian access to the area. If we, and, and that goes all the way to the fairgrounds. If Subaru is required to build their sidewalk on the east side of La Crosse Street, it will terminate at the railroad right of way. There is no sidewalk south of that. Um, and the last point I guess I'd like to make is, again, I mentioned Subaru and the property owners are good corporate citizens. They believe in Rapid City. They bought a piece, of, a, a piece of property, a building that had sat vacant for two years, stepped up to the plate, wanted to help Rapid City develop, redevelop an existing site in Rapid City. And that, that basically fits something that's in your 2014 comprehensive plan. This is, this is defined as a revitalization corridor in your comprehensive plan. And one of the things that uh, that talks about is reinvestment to re, re up, or to upgrade these buildings, um, revitalize them, repurpose them. And one of the things that that the comprehensive plan states is 
The city will explore aligning existing and or offering additional development incentives to reduce barriers and encourage infill and redevelopment in priority areas. This is a priority area. The property owners believe this fire hydrant issue and above ground telephone box are one of these barriers that your comprehensive plan states you will work with them on. Anyway, that's our case. We'll be here to answer questions and we have the property owner here in case you have questions from her. Thank, Thank you. you. Since this is um, the public comment on these two non-consent items, we'd like to try to have the speakers um, limit their remarks to three minutes and then the, uh, the committee will ask questions. So now we're on to item number seven, stormwater management and floods. Um, Chair recognizes Randy Horsley. Uh, I am Randy Horsley. Um, I was at the city council meeting a few weeks ago where we talked about the May 18th flooding. Um, we're here today. Um, I actually intended on being here two weeks ago, but unfortunately didn't quite make it here in time. Um, we uh, were looking to get the flooding um, put onto the specific city council agenda to try to get this addressed and get something actually done from here. Um, for anyone who's unaware, um, we have an awful number of different people on the Mount Rushmore, West Boulevard, um, locale that got flooding in that storm as well as obviously the robbinsdale area which i'm sure everyone in this room is fully aware of um and uh we'd just like to address that further thank you thank you chair recognizes sean crawl on the same item thank you um i do live in the west boulevard area but i'm not here on behalf of me i left my downspouts off when i was doing landscaping so my basement water is my own issue. And I think that's what most of the times people are dealing with when insurance companies have to deal with water in the basement and why they don't cover it. This is a little bit different of a situation. And for those of you who have not seen what um, actually happened on Clark Street, I don't know, is this on? Would you like to just um, have your comments be uh, three minutes just right now, and then we'll ask you to show those when the item comes up? That's fine. OK. Um, and so this flooding that happened here um, isn't something that should fall into any sort of a flood insurance program. I don't think anybody that's anywhere along this road <laughs> would ever think that they were in a flood area where a situation like this would happen. And I think that when you're going forward with looking at this in the Department of Transportation and when they did this project, this is not a, if it's a 100 year event, it's a 100 year event that happened within the first six months of it being open. So that's obviously a rarity that that would happen so quickly. But the damage that was caused on this, I think is something that needs to really be looked at because if the people that are along this street are gonna be required to carry flood insurance into the future, in order to cover something like this. I think if it is an act of God, I think it's up to the city and public works to decide how it is that they can best mitigate acts of God. And I think that in a situation like this, asking them to uh, carry flood insurance in what is actually more of probably a 100,000 year old or flood plain um, up on Mount Rushmore Road, I think is unfair to ask residents to do that as the result of a public works project, regardless of whether it's Department of Transportation or City of Rapid. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll um, take up these items with the city council members. We'll go to item number six, request from MF Properties LLC for variance to waive the requirement to install sidewalk per city ordinance 12.08.060 along La Crosse Street for the property located at 601 East Omaha Street. I already read it in, but just once again for a reminder, please uh, chair recognizes Lisa Modrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I ask Dale Tech a question? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Dale. So the conversation, including what we have in our links here, makes a, a clear statement that we do have uh, this property connecting, it sounds like, the city land behind it. And then we've got the infrastructure that is in the way. We've got the, uh, the fire hydrant and the phone line box. And the question I've got for you is, is this where we need to step in and do our due diligence to move that into a, a designated right of way that would work so that we can appropriately put a sidewalk into this location? I'm going to answer your question in this regard. 
it's not unusual to try to install sidewalks and in properties that are already developed where there are items in the right of way that preclude the sidewalk from being in a very consistent location we've got many examples all over town where sidewalks have been installed where they go around things where they're adjusted slightly to avoid those type of obstacles as i understand it that should be uh, i won't say easy but an uh, uh, something that can be accommodated around the fire hydrant uh, the pedestal box as i understand can be buried uh, i think the uh, utility company has said that they could put a box in that's uh, ground mounted and the sidewalk can go um, right over the top of it or include that pedestal box right in it so there are options to be able to install this sidewalk without removing uh, all of the obstacles so that's not an un uh, unusual thing that happens in this community when there's adjustments made all the time so have you uh, given the clear indication of what could be done or how to work through this project with FMG I'm gonna defer to Ted Johnson he's been working with them I believe that information has been shared thank you thank you yes we have returned a letter to the owner saying we suggested the fix would be to shift the sidewalk slightly behind the hydrant and do the same thing with the pedestal it would encroach onto their property slightly and would require a pedestrian easement but as far as the hydrant there'd be no reason to move the hydrant there'd be no extra expense or very little extra expense to do that to shift around the pedestal may take some curb removal and replacement but we don't have that information exactly but we have provided that to the applicant made that suggestion they were not in favor of that so since this is city owned equipment would that be something then that the city would take responsibility of in order to assist with this expansion of this uh, this property because I can understand that they don't want to have an additional easement on top of it uh, coming over the property line when they've already got a pretty extensive right-of-way zone um, no we have not paid to re relocate hydrants for sidewalk installation we have also not forced utilities to move utilities for private utilities to move their structures for private improvements you don't uh, initiate that we have not no but you could I do not know that we have not done that um, there is some statutory allowances for us to, to require some things for public city improvements it's a little more marginal whether it's for public or for private improvements that may be a, an attorney question or an attorney lawsuit issue and also uh, I, I saw in the notes that we had in our link that by policy we don't reuse fire hydrants what's the reason for that I'll take that one <clears throat> um, it's just like we're using used water main pipe um, anytime you remove something expose it to the air bacteria things like that can get inside of that um, piece of water infrastructure we take the protection of our water system very seriously we don't want any sort of contamination even possibly entering our system and causing any sort of a health hazard uh, so that's the reason why if, wa if a, um, a hydrant or any piece of water f infrastructure is removed we don't reuse it uh, there was a issue that came up a number of years ago on a development where a contractor was caught using used water main uh, and that's a, not a good thing they were severely punished for that and uh, I don't believe the state requirements even allow the use of used material for new water main systems. So in this day and age, we don't have any way of repurposing hydrants? The only way I think it could be repurposed would be to send it back to the factory and have it factory refurbished, mm -hmm. recoded to make sure that there is not a, a possibility of any bacterial uh, contamination. And can I ask one more question to Mr. No one else Hutch. is in the queue, so go okay. ahead, Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. It's all mine. May I ask you another question, Mr. Foster? I know she's going to want you up there. So if the city of Rapid City took a partnership responsibility of this area that is causing the heartache, would that then proceed with the sidewalk along La Crosse? 
I'll let Jackie answer that, the property owner. Hi, I'm Jackie Vesley. I'm here representing MF Properties. Um, if the city would participate, we are, we're not totally against putting the sidewalk in. Our concern is, first of all, that we're gonna lose property. Mm -hmm. We're butting up against our, we've got huge pole lights. We're butting up against those right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we had initially did not oppose putting the sidewalk in we were under the understanding that the city would relocate that fire hydrant because it doesn't make sense to have utility boxes or fire hydrants in the middle of your sidewalk you, we're required to keep those sidewalks cleared for the public and it's almost impossible if you've got a fire hydrant in the middle it's it's bound to get damaged and um, so we're, we're not totally against that I mean, of course, we would prefer not to have to put the sidewalk in uh, because there isn't much foot traffic there. Um, it's, you know, only during the probably the central states fair is where there's foot traffic there. So that's the tough role that we have up here is we've got an ordinance that says sidewalks go in. We understand that. They absolutely can't get in there. But when we run into a snag here, it seems like we can pull this together as a as a unity, so I hope we can move forward with some kind of an idea. And I will relinquish my speaking so that uh, Councilman John can take over. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thank uh, you. Chair recognizes John Roberts. Thank you very much, and hi, Jackie, and I love my new Subaru. So, <laughs> uh, but I do need to talk to the engineer, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Thank you. <laughs> so, you were saying earlier that you'd propose putting in a, a curbside si sidewalk. That was what we had on original drawings. And that sidewalk would have stayed outside of the fire hydrant and the no, electrical the fire, box? No, the fire hydrant and the box would still have to be moved in either okay. case. Except within that existing right of way, the fire hydrant would then be placed in the 18 foot or 18 inch area between the sidewalk and the property line. So it wouldn't require it would just any more. barely fit. Yes, I mean, it wouldn't require any more easement is what you're saying if you did the sidewalk that way? It's, yeah, it, it's nip and tuck, you can make it fit. Um, okay. Barely. I guess one of the reasons I was wondering why that was denied, other than the fact that, you know, moving the fire hydrant, because if you look north of there on La Crosse Street, that's the type of sidewalk that's in up there. So I believe, am I correct? North on La Crosse Street, north of Omaha? Yes, north of Omaha. That, that actually, it's, I'll call it a hybrid sidewalk. I believe there's a three to five foot paved boulevard between the curb and gutter and the sidewalk. So in theory, it's probably an eight or a nine foot wide sidewalk. Oh, okay, so it's wider than it's what you're proposing down there. It's kind of a hybrid type of a thing they built. Okay, well, you know, and that's one of the things I think maybe we can work around is how far in does that fire hydrant sit? It's almost exactly in the middle of the boulevard. Okay, okay. Because I, for me, either way, I mean, I, I, could, <laughs> I could wave this sidewalk in a heartbeat. It wouldn't bother me one bit because, you know, it's going to go to the railroad tracks and it's going to quit for right now. And, you know, we have the ability as a council sometime in the future to call a sidewalk in. We've always had that ability. But, you know, like Ms. Modric said, to the south of you, it's going to connect to nothing which is kind of interesting since that's a piece of city property and we don't require ourselves to put in sidewalks. So, you know, we're asking somebody to put a sidewalk in that has no connection to our own property. So, anyway, thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Amanda Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I follow up with a question to Ted, please? Yes, please. Thank you. So, Ted, it, uh, the, the option was made to put in, and I believe if I'm using the terms right, a curbside sidewalk that goes to the curb. Why, why is that being denied by staff? Well, thank you. Um, our standard requirement is yeah. property line sidewalk. It is safer, even though there's a short separation, but the farther we can get the sidewalk away from the curb and away from the street, the safer it is, especially on these high traffic highly congested streets, we can remove it 
you, or provide separation between the street, the curb, and the sidewalk, the pedestrians. We do that. Uh, we looked at this and with having to relocate the hydrant either way, it seemed better to try to err on the side of safety than on convenience, I guess. And it is five foot sidewalk as opposed to six foot, so it is a little cheaper to put in a five foot sidewalk. So, and did I just hear you say that whether whether they do it property line or they do it curbside, the height, your recommendation is, is to remove or relocate the hydrant? No, ma'am. Our recommendation would be to shift the sidewalk behind the hydrant. It would encroach slightly onto their property in their landscaped area. We would not relocate the hydrant. It would just go beside it. We would need to secure it a small pedestrian easement to allow people to use all the sidewalk but that was our first choice was to not mess with the hydrant but if they do want to stay in the right of way they want to move the hydrant then we would still prefer the property line sidewalk just for the safety okay um, madam chair may I ask a question Thank Go ahead. You. so um, and then so I understand that you didn't want to really look at um, giving up any of the right of way or uh, easement on your property because um, it's your property. I get that. Right. But what I'm hearing is this would just be a small section in order to accommodate the hydrant. Well, there's also the telephone utility box um, that I, I wasn't aware that it could be buried is one point. Um, and then we would be what it would do then if we do a if you take a more of a right away into our property the sidewalk kind of goes at an angle off to the side of the hydrant and then we have to hook back around it's i mean it's not conducive to keeping it cleared um, and one other point i would want to make you know there's a lot of emphasis put on green space and landscaping and so forth um, and what this putting the sidewalk in will do is totally eradicate any of the green space that we've got on that side of the property right now it's very beautifully la manicured it's landscaped we just redid the landscaping last year or within the last two years um, and that will all be gone except for a small portion of the rock so I mean right now it's irrigated and and landscaped Thank you. Madam Chair, may I follow back up with Ted? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ted, I, I didn't bring my iPad to pull this up, but when I looked at this, it seemed to me that there was indication of foot traffic along La Crosse. It, did I see that correctly when I expanded it upward to take a look at it? Because um, they're indicating that this is green space and it's not being currently walked on, but I seem to recall a foot traffic path on La Crosse, and I do know that the Central States Fair is down there. Yes, thank you. There is not any indication or wear path on this property. It's well manicured, well maintained. If you go south of their driveway into the unmanicured, unirrigated area, there is an evident path that shows up on rapid map. So and there that's is foot traffic that uses a south part that shows up their property is well maintained groomed grass so i don't know how much traffic is on there specifically or if it's conducive to walk on but it is landscaped but there is south of it just adjacent south of this there is a defined path okay thank you um you know i, I think it's a good discussion and it seems like both sides have a, ha, a, has some ideas here um, i would appreciate if it was all possible to give the applicant and the city staff more time to come up with an option because it, there is really no land geographical obstruction to putting in the sidewalk at this time and i know as a city council we've talked at least since i've been on it the last six years to make sure that we are progressive in putting in the sidewalks now because they just get more expensive and if the city council orders it in we do have that option but the city council still has of yet today to actually exercise that option to order in sidewalks and so we still end up with sidewalks going to nowhere and trying to get people to fill them in after the fact so i would really like to see personally this sidewalk go in i'm hearing that there 
there might be an option here. I would recommend if we could allow someone to make a motion to continue it for two weeks if it's not a hardship on this so that we could see if they can, between staff and the applicant, they can come up with a way to put in this sidewalk that makes it easy to maintain because that is one of the issues I have with when we looked at ordering in sidewalks and they were talking about putting in, you know, for the whole street, there were a lot of vacant and I'm like, wait a minute. We're asking property owners to maintain the sidewalks. You gotta have at least a structure there so that they can at least maintain the sidewalk. So I understand what you're saying as an applicant of having to maintain that sidewalk. It will be your responsibility right. to maintain that right. sidewalk. Um, but I would like to see, I would recommend if any of my peers would go with a two week and l see if we can come up with a better option. Um, if I had to vote today, I would probably support the sidewalk. So I'd like to, I'd like to at least hear an option of that, that would be conducive to both sides. Thank you. Chair recognizes Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may make that motion to continue this item for two weeks. Second. Motion to continue by Nordstrom, second by Scott. All in favor? Make, Madam oh, Chair. Excuse me. Um, okay, Ma excuse me. Yeah. Madam Chair. You're going to talk, aren't you? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> talk it up. <laughs> we understand wanting to pull the trigger real no, quick. No, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I really think this is a good discussion. So yes, I, just... I, I appreciate the discussion as well. I'm an advocate of sidewalks uh, to go in wherever possible. When it's prudent that we could put in a sidewalk. Would, when we do this continuation for the next two weeks, would you also take a look at Mr. Foster uh, and, and and this request goes to you and then also to staff to take a look at the demand trail that I'm looking at on the south edge of this property. And then there also is a fire hydrant that is on that uh, city property as well. The railroad track seems to be abandoned, so it's, for me that's not an issue. Um, the, 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 it, where, where it comes into, for me, the uh, curious part is what would that do to the uh, owners of the uh, Subaru property when it, and I apologize, I forgot your name. Jackie Vesley. Jackie, thank you. Um, when, when it comes to your property there on that green space, I'm, I, I, I like the idea, it was well manicured and I agree with everything that everybody's stated on it so far. But again, I'm, I'm an advocate for safety, part of this being a sidewalk being installed on it. And uh, since there is that heavy demand trail, it appears to be a heavy demand trail on the adjoining property to the south of you, that's why I'm in favor of this. Uh, but if we can work around, if, if there's some other options with this fire hydrant plus this second fire hydrant that I'm noticing here on my image, and then a, uh, a telephone box, Somebody's going to have to pay for that somewhere along the line. I don't want to make sure that we're being fair about that as well. Um, so that's where I'm at. And so if the folks can take a look at those concerns, I'd appreciate it and come back with a report in a couple of weeks sure. and take a look at that. Thank you, Jackie. Yep. Thank you, Jerry. Staff, thank yep. you. We're going to go to, uh, if you'd just like to remain there, we might have some more questions. Um, <laughs> just um, Jerry. Jerry goes to John Roberts. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> Jerry, can you tell me what the distance is from the curb to that fire hydrant or to that box, whichever is the closest? In round numbers, three feet. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that, that me and one of my council compatriots were talking about right there is we were talking about high, hybrid sidewalks. You know, one of the things that we could talk about would be narrowing that sidewalk down because there's not one heck of a lot of foot traffic in that area. Um, and I don't see a lot of foot traffic coming in the near future. Um, and I do know that area pretty well. I go by there multiple times a day, going home and going to my office. Um, I think, like they said, the majority of the time there's even any foot traffic on there is during the fair. So, you know, other than the occasional person going back and forth. So I think maybe one thing that we should think about is, you know, possibly instead of taking the sidewalk out or making them move something or the city move something or, you know, even the possibility of, of us getting into a lawsuit in the future because I wouldn't give up right away to the city to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to happen there because one of the things that we're not talking about too is all of a sudden she takes out that, all of her landscaping, what does that do to her, to her beautification points? 
does she have to remove them somewhere on the pro or move them somewhere on the property is that costing her more money <laughs> you know there's a lot of issues that we're not looking at that this sidewalk can cause to the business owner and you know one of the things that i think the city should do is we should help our existing business owners in fact we just had a monday night in the council we had a you know somebody come in and talk about one of the things that we knew need to do is help our existing business owners in rapid city so i think there's options here i think there's ways to make it work without it being financially you know difficult for the property owners or for the city so you know i i, I hope that if this goes back for a couple of weeks and that's another thing i wanted to ask you jerry is this going to cost in, or cause any problems moving it back a couple of weeks building permits occupancy anything oh, i think we can live with that okay um but if we do i hope that you can get together with staff and hopefully we can get something worked out on this because i think there's options and you know if it doesn't work with staff bring it in front of the council again because you know we have a lot of options so anyway thank you chair recognizes J dale tech thank you madam chair just to clarify it'll be three weeks because our last public works committee meeting is on july 31st so it'll be three weeks from today if you're going to continue i don't know if that causes a problem on anyone's side but just wanted to remind you of that Um, I have a couple questions though here at this point also. Um, Dale, I don't think I heard anybody mention during our discussions what the cost of replacing or moving the fire hydrant would be. It'll be in excess of $4,500. That is with getting a new one? Correct. Or? Okay, so, so, all right, I need that one. And let's see here. Um, for Jackie. I see a lot more people walking, a lot more people riding bikes, and that seems to be kind of a, a path from North Rapid uh, to the bike path there down by the, um, the, the Central States Fairgrounds. So I could see that possibly making this a, a necessary thing to do. But I'm still, you know, I, my mind isn't made up, so we'll, you know, talk to you guys again and see, see what happens when we get together and on July 31st, because I'm just always for, you know, improving our ability to have pedestrian or, or bike traffic and, and make that more convenient. So um, in the meantime, we have a motion to continue this matter until July 31st. All in favor? Aye. Those opposed? And the motion carries. We'll see you again on July 31st. Now we're going to go to the uh, number seven. The stormwater management and floods uh, and chair is going to recognize Dale Tech for a presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I've got a fairly lengthy presentation to give you today uh, regarding stormwater management and floods in Rapid City. Uh, not only me, but Kale McNabo and Paul, I'm sorry, your last. Paul Kraft from Spurlick Consulting will be jumping in in the middle of this presentation uh, to uh, give a presentation of the Robbinsdale stormwater detention pond that was recently constructed. Uh, uh, with that, I'll get kicked off here. So uh, what we're going to talk about today, history of stormwater management and floods in Rapid City, uh, the Mead Hawthorne drainage basin uh, discussion. Uh, Spurlick's presentation regarding the performance of the uh, Robbinsdale Pond, our dra stormwater drainage utility project funding and sources and where those dollars go, and then finish up with a very big part of our community as well as others, FEMA flood insurance and, and FEMA flood designations. So with that, I'll get started. Um, I always like to refer to the picture in the hanging in the mayor's office. There's a picture of downtown Rapid City taking around the turn of the century as well as one in more recent times. If you look at the, the historical picture, it is dirt from building to building with no stormwater drainage facilities. That's just what was done back then. Um, there was no consideration into to flood mitigation or drainage uh, concerns. So that picture is the epitome of what happened back in those historical days and slowly over time it got better and better but i'll go through some of the, some of those examples 
Um, you know, they more or less took range and low ground around rivers. Obviously, uh, development started along waterways because people needed water to survive. They needed water uh, to drink. They needed water for livestock. They needed water for industrial purposes. So most communities are centered around water. Uh, obviously in, in the beautiful Black Hills and Rapid City, uh, quite scenic in nature as well. So a lot of homes are built right along the creek, uh, not only for the necessity for water, but for uh, scenery and, and serene conditions uh, that people enjoy. Uh, there was many gullies that people didn't see water run down in a couple of years, so they were filled in and streets were uh, built across it. Um, this picture is taken in the gap, as you can see by the lack of, of uh, development there. That was pretty early on in Rapid City's history. Um, a lot of the development that occurs right along Rapid Creek, as well as a lot, a lot of our older basins, uh, you can see in the right center part is the original town site of Rapid City, which was Dakota Territory at the time, which was platted in 1876. Uh, and then obviously the next area of growth was 1883. Well, as the city expands, uh, when you have the areas developed right adjacent to the creek, and then you expand and, and have more urban runoff, you're running it into parts of towns that did not have adequate drainage facilities. Uh, the developers uh, back in that time, there was just not a lot of forethought. Uh, large storm events have come and gone historically, and I'll get into some of those examples, but uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the flooding issues that happened historically were just shrugged off as, well, that's what happens when it rains a lot. To summarize the historical management of draining, you know, it was all piecemeal. People did what they could back then. Crisis control. If things flooded, they cleaned it up and just moved on without any regard to making any improvements, uh, hoping the problem will go away and not return. But as uh, history proves, it's going to rain, and it's going to rain again and again and again. And at some point in time, we're going to have flooding that will meet or exceed the, the disaster that occurred here in 1972. That's just the fact of life. The next few slides kind of describe some of the historical flooding. Uh, June 1909 flood, this picture is taken downtown Rapid City. Uh, it was the worst flood in downtown Rapid City prior to 1972. Uh, as you can see, footnote over there, Canyon Lake washed out and remained dry until 1932. Uh, the flow in Rapid City was about 13,000 CFS uh, compared to the Rapid City flood of 1972 of 50,000 CFS. Uh, four deaths and $100,000 worth of damage in 1909. 1952 flood. Um, as you can see, rapid city flooding uh, at a discharge of about 2,500 CFS. Uh, the photo on the right is the Evergreen Drive area, so this would be over in West Rapid uh, along Jackson Boulevard. 1962 flood, a uh, severe flood that happened on the west side of Rapid City, uh, came out of the South Canyon drainage basin, uh, so in the northwest part of town there, where uh, South Canyon Road turns into Nemo Road and leaves the community, that's where Pierce Street's located, that's where the, the damage occurred, as well as Cleghorn Canyon, which is in this kind of the southwest part of town. As you can see from the severe damage to the automobiles and, and homes there, a fairly significant uh, flood event. And then obviously the 1972 flood. I won't go into the statistics. Everyone uh, knows the history of the 72 flood and what it did to our community and how it shaped it. Since 1972, here are uh, some examples of heavy rains that we've had and, and flooding that it has caused um, going back to 1975. Uh, seems like every few years certainly we have uh, unusual significant rainfall that occurs in some part of our community. It's not necessarily citywide but uh, concentrated in, in parts of town where it, it'll cause problems. 
uh, most recently the May 18th uh, flood event that happened in the Robbinsdale area or in the what we call the Mead Hawthorne drainage basin and we'll talk about that at length here I guess I'd also like to mention just in the last week in national news, speaking of unusual floods, communities of Des Moines, Iowa, Houston, Texas, uh, over in Japan, 155 people were killed in the last two days due to unprecedented flooding. These aren't tropical storm floods. These are, are uh, thunderstorm type floods. So, uh, Focusing on the management of drainage, uh, you know, as Rapid City becomes more urbanized, uh, the, the amount of runoff increases. Uh, when you start replacing uh, natural grass with rooftops and garages and additional development, you're going to produce more water. Um, sometime in the, probably in the 1970s, this community uh, partly in response of the 72 flood, but I know for a fact it was going on before the 72 flood. The Corps of Engineers was looking to uh, do floodplain mapping in Rapid City. So the 72 flood came at the time that they were preparing the flood maps. Uh, they waited a few years with updated information. And then uh, I, I believe the first set of maps were entered or for, for Rapid City were created and adopted in the 1970s. On the heels of that, I think a lot of uh, people in government and that experienced the flood realized that, hey, we need to look at drainage in Rapid City. Uh, so there were uh, things called drainage basin design plans that have been developed kind of identifies what, where the water is going to run and maybe to what magnitude uh, throughout all parts of town. There are currently 21 drainage basins that have been studied. Um, a lot of them are, were done in the 80s, early 90s. They need to be updated. We have updated a number of them in, in recent times. Um, so once again, these Drainage basin design plans weren't the end-all, solve-all problems for drainage in Rapid City. They identified uh, what the condition was and what possible fixes were. Here's a map of all the drainage basins that we have throughout town. Mead Hawthorne drainage basin, uh, history of flooding and uh, down there. A lot of that is attributed to most of it was developed uh, starting in the 30s up through the 60s when most of the stormwater was just expected to run down streets. Um, back in about 2003, FEMA remapped not only uh, Rapid City but all of Pennington County. That's when they started on it. The maps became official a decade later in 2013. So obviously uh, the Robbinsdale, Mead Hawthorne drainage basin area is a flood prone area and has been mapped as uh, thus through FEMA. Uh, here's a blow up of the Mead Hawthorne uh, drainage basin. Uh, the Mead portion of it is considered in yellow and the Hawthorne portion of it is considered in blue. Uh, when the team from Spurlick uh, um, comes up, they'll be focusing primarily on the Hawthorne portion of it. And I'll be speaking more on the um, Mead portion of that. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Joanne Wilkins that lives on uh, East Foreman Street, uh, 233 East Foreman. She was kind enough to share a lot of her historical information uh, regarding that. She, I believe, moved in there just after the flood in 1973, I believe. Uh, this picture was taken uh, right behind her house, looking in the channel that went behind her house. Uh, as you can see, it's full. And at that time, it was just a dirt channel. It was uh, either a remnant of a natural drainage that was there when the, the area was developed, or it was something carved in after the fact to try to get the area to drain. Uh, flooding, once again, 1975. This is... Uh, looking out her front door where that pickup truck is parked and then looking off to the west uh, on the photo on the right. Once again, a dirt channel. Um, 
water running out of its banks, uh, encroaching onto adjoining properties. So, Mead Street area, there's been problems uh, historically. Uh, so, 1977, there was improvements made in the lower Mead Channel uh, area, and once again, that's the philosophy that we need to follow it's you have to start downstream and work your way up to build adequate drainage facilities if you start upstream and work your way down you're going to cause all kinds of property damage and flood damage so uh, this 1977 improvement uh, started not at the furthest downstream portion but at the uh, place that made the most sense to start uh, everything else downstream of here is pretty natural still there's natural banks and the natural creek alignment it was hasn't been developed hasn't been filled in so this project uh, was the first of many that have occurred in the Mead Hawthorne area and it was a fairly significant project uh, 1979 uh, that dirt channel that I'd shown you in those pictures from 1974 1975 a concrete square channel was then put in uh, due to issues in that area so uh, flooding in 1985 in that same area after the concrete channel had been placed so a berm was built on the what i'll call the east bank of that concrete channel to prevent the storm waters from east st ann street uh, from entering uh, the properties on that side of the channel I'm sorry, it was 1988 the berm was constructed. Uh, the years 2001, 2002, work was done in the Hawthorne uh, area. And, and once again, the Mead and Hawthorne drainage basins meet. Uh, this is another example of starting at the very downstream end of the Hawthorne uh, drainage basin to get improvements in place that can accept the stormwater from upstream. So uh, box culvert and storm sewer significant size was extended from Mead Street uh, channel up Hawthorne Street to I believe Oakland area it might have e even have gone into Robbinsdale Park um, beyond that then in the 2003-2009 period uh, there was a preliminary report to look at extending uh, a box culvert up Upper Mead Street uh, above the channel to alleviate the flooding that occurred on those homes regularly. Uh, as I recall, I think it was a week or two after the 1972 flood, there was a fatality on Mead Street when some folks got trapped in their car and uh, one of them drowned, I believe, on Mead Street. So uh, once again, Mead Street's had a history of uh, flooding over the years and then this project uh, kicked off to extend those drainage improvements further upstream to alleviate that. Uh, I spoke earlier about the FEMA flood mapping. Uh, this is the current uh, flood map in the Robbinsdale area on the Mead Channel. So as you can see it on the right side of the photo there, uh, that's in the channel, the open channel part. Uh, once you get to about the center of the the photo then it switches and goes right up the street because that's where all the water historically has run and that's where it runs today and then once you get to Elm and west of Elm uh, you can see the properties primarily on the east side of the channel there are located within the regulatory floodplain or the hundred year floodplain uh, once again a lot of credit to Miss, uh, Miss, Mrs. Wilkins, who lives on East Foreman. She grabbed her camera during the May or June 18th. I'm sorry, that uh, should say May 18th. Uh, my apologies, I, I got anxious when I created this. Uh, shows the channel, the concrete channel uh, behind her house has exceeded the capacity and water has run into uh, multiple neighbors' properties there. As I understand it, uh, uh, the property to the west of her got water in it. Her house got a little water in it. Uh, to my knowledge, no properties on the south side of the channel had any water in them. Uh, 2004, there was a report by FMG Engineering uh, 
and it was the only alternative looked at. So the, they were tasked with, well, we believe a, a option is to bury all this drainage underground up the streets, intercept it all, and move it through the system all underground. So that's what this report in 2004 analyzed. It was a five-phase construction project. Uh, total cost in 2004 dollars of $10 million. Uh, I believe we had spent a significant a portion of that just on the first phase uh, due to uh, just inflation by the time we got to constructing uh, that first phase in 2008. Um, so with that where I'm going to leave you here is, yeah, there was work done, a report done in 2004. Once again, a preliminary report. It's not the end all say all of what can be done to solve drainage issues. Other things need to be looked at. Uh, and, and with the addition of the FEMA floodplain in the area, uh, that also changes the way that we have to do things. What staff is proposing to do uh, is create a capital improvement plan to restudy this area. Uh, as you know, we had areas in the Centennial Street, in the North Haines area, and uh, also in the South Canyon area where we hired a consultant with obviously much better technology to relook at the FEMA floodplains to see where the true risks are and that's what needs to be done in this Robbinsdale area too, the Mead Hawthorne. So that's what staff is proposing uh, to do. And then uh, in addition to that, that will give us a much better idea and roadmap of where drainage improvements um, should be constructed. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Spurlick Consulting. They've got a, a very uh, impressive presentation here to give on the performance of the Robbinsdale Park drainage improvements. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Members of the committee, uh, my name is Cale Macnibo. I own Spurlick Consulting. Uh, we are the design engineers for the Robbinsdale reconstruction under contract with the city. Um, so as part of uh, this project, we were tasked with uh, design of the detention cell that's been newly constructed in Robbinsdale Park. So if you've been out there, it was, it was a lot of trees and, and a former detention cell that was, was not functioning up to uh, you know, the capacity that we were looking for. As part of our task, we redesigned the detention cell. Um, in fact, it kind of went into operation on a Tuesday, and then that following Friday was the May 18th rain event. Um, obviously, a high intensity rain event. We saw a lot of water entering the detention cell along with a, a car that got swept off a of Fairlane Drive. Um, so that happened Friday night. Monday morning, uh, you know, we went down and started cross sectioning Fairlane Drive. You can see the debris line in the road to try to evaluate the depth of the water in the road. And when you're a drainage engineer, you can get kind of geeky about that stuff. So we got, uh, went out there to try to evaluate how much water was in the storm sewer and how much was on the road. And in that process, we assembled this presentation, which will give you a snapshot of how the detention cell works, how much water was coming in, and uh, essentially the overall function of the detention cell in conjunction with the Mead Basin. And with that, I'd like to show Paul Kraft out of my office who prepared the presentation. So go ahead, Paul. Once again, thanks for having us out here. Um, I'm Paul Kraft, as uh, Kale pointed out. And I, with this presentation, just kind of wanted to kind of point out um, how the old uh, detention cell worked and operated, how we approved upon it, and kind of what happened during the uh, May 18th storm, and also make kind of a few recommendations from going forward what we can do with uh, drainage uh, throughout Rapid City. So we start out here with a little bit of background. Um, this is the uh, old detention cell of Robbinsdale Park. Let's see if you can get that. Um, so there's two ponds that are located in Robbinsdale Park. Um, so here is Fairlane Drive. This is where all the water on uh, May 18th occurred that came down the road. Here's the main pond. We call it Pond 1 here for you guys. And then Pond 2 up here to the north. All this water uh, moves towards the north over into Oakland Street and then ultimately down to um, Hawthorne Avenue uh, underground and on the street and then ultimately over to the uh, Hawthorne, or the uh, Mead Channel. 
Um, as you can see from these two pictures, uh, from Pond 2, there is a large inlet structure originally uh, created over here to capture some of the water. And this is also used as a junction box. There's um, some culverts underneath the road. This is where all that uh, gets combined. And then over here is Pond number 1. Uh, this is the, the main pond to hold back the water. You can see there's a lot of cottonwoods that have grown in there in the past, um, reducing a lot of the water capacity that could be held in the pond. So a little bit of background about where all the water comes from into Robbinsdale Park. So Robbinsdale Park, uh, highlighted over here in yellow, there is about one square mile all the way back actually to Skyline Drive, um, flow all the way down through uh, back behind the hospital and into Fairlane Drive and ultimately Robbinsdale Park. Um, even though there's just one square mile, as you can see from May 18th, there's a significant amount of water that does come down into this area and into Robbinsdale Park. Uh, additionally, there are um, some detention cells that are located uh, in this uh, drainage basin. There are six drainage, uh, dra detention ponds um, upstream of Robbinsdale Park. Um, the biggest one uh, that you can probably see the most is over here by the hospital. There's a large one tucked on the uh, southeast side of it. Um, and then here are the two that uh, are created here in Robbinsdale Park. So what we have here is basically an overview of the new pond that we've created for Robbinsdale Park. Uh, to kind of orientate yourself, um, over here is East Fairlane Drive, so uh, north is to the right. All the water comes through uh, Fairlane Drive into uh, what's called impact basins, and I'll kind of uh, describe a little later what they all do and what they are. Uh, fills up in the pond over here, all the extra water ends up going through an intake structure, and then that's routed uh, through a four by seven box culvert into another junction box, and ultimately into some infrastructure that was already installed uh, for uh, Hawthorne drainage. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the uh, impact basins. So these are these, those large um, concrete structures you see over when Fairlane dead ends into the park. And so what they basically do is they reduce the water velocity that is coming out of the storm sewer. So what would normally happen, if you kind of see this cutaway slide over here, is water is coming through, well, normally it would just shoot out, um, cause a lot of erosion and everything like that. These impact basins, what they do is they have a wall, which is this guy right here. Um, all this water comes out, hits the wall, falls down, dissipates all that energy, so that way you don't have risk to um, the public, for instance, if they're standing out here and getting swept away, all that energy is uh, taken care of over here. Um, like to point out too that um, there are three impact basins um, in Robbinsdale Park. Only one is currently active. Um, the other two will eventually be active when other improvements are uh, put upstream of Robbinsdale Park. I do have a video right here too. You can kind of see how um, the impact basin works. So as you can see, that water hits the backside. Uh, when it actually goes over the wall, um, it's a much uh, lower velocity than normal. Uh, goes over some riprap and then slowly trickles down into the pond. So you can see there's uh, very little erosion. Um, going through here, so uh, the big reason we used this guy was to try to mitigate the uh, uh, any threats to the public or anything like this. Keeps everything within that 20 feet. That's where all the, the dangerous part is, is back in there. So for the new pond, number one, this is the, the large pond that you see on the south side of Robbinsdale Park. It's approximately three times the volume of the original pond. It also includes uh, what's called a water quality volume. Uh, basically, there is about three and a half feet at the bottom that we slowly release water. This allows all the sediment, garbage, and everything to be collected in a little small area and doesn't allow it to go out to Rapid Creek and eventually you know, pollute things downstream. Um, with this pond, with its size, you can re uh, greatly reduce how much uh, water is released downstream. In this case, you're seeing a reduction of about 60% on here. So there's a very high significant amount of uh, water being reduced that would normally be um, going down Hawthorne Avenue. Um, this is the intake structure in pond number one and kind of show you how it works. So uh, as I uh, alluded to, that first uh, three and a half feet, this is where the water uh, slowly builds up and is released over 40 hours. That's that first three and a half feet. After that, um, there is an intake structure, which is this little guy here on the right, um, that water spills into. And eventually, if, water, if we have a large enough, a large enough storm, uh, water builds up and then goes into a secondary one. Um, I can show you here a little video. So you can see there's only about four or five inches of water um, going through this grate. Um, let me speed this guy up a little bit, but uh, it doesn't look like there's uh, too much water going through it. But eventually I'm going to uh, pan over and look into where the box culvert actually is. And you can see that there's a significant amount of water that's actually rushing through that guy. Um, I know it doesn't look like much, everything's pretty calm, and that's kind of the, the point of the detention pond is to make sure that you know safety-wise everything is uh, good for the public. And you can see here, this is all the water coming through uh, underneath there's a significant amount of water and um, that's only with that first grate with a, just a few inches of water above it. 
So that kind of brings us um, to the May 18th, uh, 2018 storm and kind of how the uh, pond responded to all that and uh, what we kind of saw during the storm. So around 6.15, uh, there was a rain event that occurred in Rapid City. Uh, moments in the rain, uh, rain event, the intensity quickly strengthened over Ro the Robbinsdale area. Uh, we had the National Weather Service that took a look at how much water um, they had, and they had about 1.79 inches. Um, when you actually look at the rain gauge, about one inch of that fell in only 15 minutes. And then unofficially, um, going through Facebook, um, the internet, um, there's a few people who actually posted in the Robbinsdale area what they had in their rain gauges. And there's, there's one gentleman here that had four and a half inches for that same rain, uh, rain event. So you can imagine there's a very high intensity, you know, maybe two to three inches in 15 minutes of rain that happened right there. So uh, when this uh, event happened, that high intensity basically caused all the infrastructure that uh, was undersized to become overwhelmed. There is currently on Fairlane Drive, which is what we're looking at here in this picture, uh, there's a retirement community over here and over on this green area, that's uh, where we have some apartments. Um, there's a 48 inch pipe that sits kind of over where these trees are, that becomes full. And then once that becomes full, everything else ends up dumping onto the streets. And you can see there's approximately about two feet of water that's actually on East Fairlane Drive. So this is kind of a before and after picture of uh, the pond. So I was actually out there that morning of May 18th and I took a couple pictures and there's only about two feet of water in the pond at about 10 a.m. Um, by 7.45, um, we're sitting over kind of over in this area, the pond is full. Um, the actual volume of this pond is 33 acre feet. Um, to kind of give a nice example of what that actually looks like, take an actual football field and put 25 feet of water in it. There's a tremendous amount of water that uh, can be stored in this pond. Uh, there's actually so much uh, water going through this pond that it's actually it activated the emergency spillway, which if you're looking at the pond here, is located right here, which dumps into a, some mini ponds to kind of hold back the water and not rush it um, over to the uh, residents that live over here on the north side of the pond. Eventually it makes the corner into another intake and any extra ends up going off onto the street section. Um, from all the water that was going on, uh, coming out of pond number one, you can go to the very northern pond, pond number two, and we opened up the grate to see kind of how much water is going through here, and here's a video. You can see there is a tremendous amount of water um, going through here. Uh, there is about two to four feet of water um, going through uh, that junction box there, so there's a significant amount of water. Um, so now I kind of wanted to touch base on the, the basically the engineering that goes behind why we put in detention cells. Um, so this right here is Robbinsdale Park. These are our two ponds. Um, as I kind of mentioned that all this water eventually goes over into Hawthorne Avenue and then reaches the uh, Mead Ditch over in this area. So the main function of detention pond is to reduce how much water is actually being conveyed downstream. And the other part it also does, it changes the timing of when that water reaches um, other drainage areas. Um, so kind of think of it as a, a traffic intersection with lights. That detention pond not only lessens the amount of traffic, but it also regulates when uh, cars are able to go through. So that way, instead of having four lanes, for instance, you can go down to two lanes. You can greatly reduce what the uh, infrastructure is uh, needed downstream. And so I wanted to show you this um, video over here. So this is the outlet from um, Hawthorne Avenue, right about in this area here. So all this water coming here is from our detention pond, and this is the Mead Ditch over here. And you can kind of see on the side here where the high water mark was. Um, but we're re releasing this soon, uh, much later after the uh, storm event has already occurred. So when you take a look at here, uh, we're not doubling at how much water is actually being in the Mead, uh, on the Mead Ditch. We're uh, releasing what it's out of the detention pond at a very uh, later time so that way you don't double up how much water and needing uh, extra size in, uh, in this ditch. So you can see there's a beforehand the water level is actually, let's see if I can pause this here, you can see the water level is actually reaching all the way up here at one point. Here's a debris line so it was significantly higher um, earlier in the day. Um, and then uh, to go into kind of the cost, so for the, all the drainage improvements that went into Robbinsdale Park, um, it was a roughly about $1.6 million. Um, some of your big ticket items, for instance, was the excavation. Um, as I pointed out, uh, pond number one is about three times the volume. Uh, that's about $230,000. Um, and then uh, various amounts, for instance, for instance the 140 for the um, impact basins. All in all, these major items, about $700,000 uh, went into this. Um, and with that now, we go into actually studying what happened um, on Fairlane Drive in the pond um, during the May 18th storm. 
Uh, so as uh, Kale pointed out, um, there was a significant amount of uh, water that went down Fairlane and we were able to actually go there um, that Monday after the storm and actually take some measurements. Um, so I wanted to give you a little uh, backstory of uh, this area. So East Fairlane Drive, um, here is the gas station. So here's the, uh, the light over here on uh, Fairmont and Helm. The gas station's over in this area here. This is all a FEMA regulated flood zone. It's called a zone A. Um, basically what that is, is a best guess by FEMA. It's they kind of put it on the map, but they haven't actually done a full analysis on it to um, extensively tell you where the delineation, where the water is going to end up. Um, and as part of this uh, project, we actually took a look at uh, what the water, uh, where the water should end up uh, during these storms. So I'll get a little uh, more into that. And I also want to touch base on the terminology. So what the 100-year event, 100-year uh, storm event is, is the probability of a large intensity storm happening once every 100 years. Also, that same probability is a 1% chance happening any given day. So you could have, for instance, the 100-year storm happen multiple times in a year, but over a long length of time, um, it still adds up to the same probability. So what we have here is um, the, uh, in the, D, uh, the, sorry, the uh, dark blue is what FEMA is saying is the 100-year uh, uh, floodplain. What is in the light blue is what I delineated um, for what I assume is the 100-year storm event. And the amount of water going down the road, uh, I estimated at 660 cubic feet per second. Um, so an estimate, uh, estimate of that would be if you were to line up 300 firefighters all with hoses, let them go full bore down the road, that's what it would look like. Also, if you take a look at Rapid Creek um, today, for instance, it would be about three and a half Rapid Creeks on the road and one Rapid Creek under the road in the, the storm sewer. So there's a significant amount of water going down this area. So uh, what we were able to do is actually uh, take some cross sections because we could uh, see some of the debris fields that were left after the fact. Um, from that, you can actually see here in this picture is in the blue line is what I delineated as the floodplain. And then the yellow lines are the cross sections that we cut um, starting and ending at debris fields that we could find. And you can see they come very close to what I delineated from that. Um, also, looking at some pictures uh, that we could find on the internet and what uh, people told us, um, the water is getting back into the parking lot, into this retirement communi community and everything. Um, so uh, it's a pretty fair estimate to actually say that what happened on May 18th is the 100-year storm, and we do have some data to, uh, to back that up. So then uh, with that too, we were able to kind of do a what if analysis if, for instance, uh, we didn't install the, uh, the pond uh, this year if we waited a few years. Um, so as I pointed out, the, uh, the old pond was about a third of the size of this current pond. Um, with the water coming through here, uh, there would have been significant uh, water going into the backyards of the uh, residents over to the west side of the uh, Robbinsdale Park. And the spillway that's here, um, it's a pretty good bet that the spillway would have probably failed with the amount of water having to overtop it and everything. That ultimately leads to a large amount of water flooding over uh, by the playground area, washing up at the intersection over here, and then ultimately flooding people out along Hawthorne Avenue. Uh, so this is kind of the what if scenario uh, with how much water we kind of predicted would be uh, going through. So in the blue is what I predicted uh, with our new pond, uh, what the 100 year floodplain would look like going through Hawthorne. So it's um, staying in the street um, and staying out of people's yards and everything like that. Um, but it, with the old pond is what you see in red and you can see we're covering up houses um, on a lot of uh, residents here. So um, it's safe to say that the pond you know, did its job. We didn't have significant flooding issues um, downstream of the detention pond. Uh, so now I'd like just to kind of touch base on some uh, future improvements um, that uh, uh, we're talking with the city, uh, talking with other engineers, kind of what we'd uh, like to see, um, specifically in the Robbinsdale area, and then some uh, more general um, things uh, just with uh, drainage in general. So there is another construction project um, in the Robbinsdale area um, starting in 2019 is when it's supposed to be constructed to basically extend a, uh, those two offline impact basins, take a storm sewer, and take it all the way to the Elm intersection. So here's the, the pond right now, that's what we're looking at. So there's a, about, I want to say about an 800 or so feet extension of storm sewer. Um, I did uh, want to point out too that this storm sewer doesn't have a lot of capacity, inlet capacity. There's not a lot of water going into it because the big improvement we want to do is, uh, I'll kind of touch base on it a little later, is going to go right here. Basically, we need some way of capturing all this water and get it underground before it actually gets on Fairlane Drive. 
So as uh, part of this project, uh, the city did request um, Spurlick Consulting to uh, take a look at uh, what future improvements they would like to see between basically the detention pond at the hospital and Robbinsdale Park. And so what we ended up doing is uh, delineating the subbasin that drains from the hospital to the park into smaller sections. So at each intersection of road, we could actually tell how much, uh, predict how much water is actually going um, into the road at any given intersection. And from that, we can then size what uh, existing infrastructure there is and um, add any uh, larger infrastructure and see what you know could actually have capacity to hold all that water underground. Um, so this is kind of the recommend, uh, recommended map that we ended up uh, creating out of this report. Um, so what you see in this image here is anything that's a dark line is existing infrastructure and anything that's dotted would uh, be proposed infrastructure to go in at the future time. Um, as I pointed out, um, East Fairlane Drive next year will be adding uh, additional storm sewer. Uh, we propose um, that in the not so distant future to have an additional uh, uh, reconstruction project to extend this guy all the way over to the Maple intersection. Um, there is a low spot over in this area. So to kind of get situated, here's Fairmont Boulevard, and here is the gas station. Behind the gas station, there is a low spot over in this area where we could potentially uh, put in a large junction box, uh, much like in that pond number two and then uh, the northern pond over in Robinsdale Park, have a large inlet where we could have all this water that's coming off of Anaconda, Fairmont, and go into this low area and get it underground before it ever gets to Fairline, um, allowing you to actually have uh, pretty decent access along Elm, because I know that ends up flooding uh, pretty heavily once water ends up crossing the road. Um, um, as part of this, uh, the nice part about this area is this is a, uh, an existing intersection of most of the infrastructure. So once again, all these uh, dark solid lines, that is existing infrastructure. So you see they all kind of come together in this general area. And then uh, we have the dotted line, which is my proposed um, uh, infrastructure that would go in in the future. Um, so uh, to kind of finalize this, some future recommendations, um, things we kind of talked with the city about, and then from a, a personal standpoint, what I'd like to um, see too in the, the not so distant future. Uh, the big thing is uh, to restudy the existing detention ponds. Um, that would be, you know, reconstructing them, making them larger. Um, right now, a lot of them have been silted in, um, need some maintenance and everything on them. Um, the bigger you make the ponds, uh, we can control how much water is actually going down and lessen the, uh, the flooding effects that are downstream. Um, the other part, too, is uh, when we design these ponds or, you know, go in to reconstruct them, uh, make sure that we're designing these ponds to be accessible for maintenance. Um, that's a big issue for some of them where you have very steep terrain, um, putting in some type of access road so we can actually get maintenance crews down there. Um, then from uh, a personal standpoint, um, I would like to see actually uh, a restudy of all the existing drainage basin design plans. I know uh, Dale touched base on them. Basically, those are... Um, an inventory of all of our infrastructure and how they kind of work together and what our estimates are for what type of um, storm flows we're getting in the streets and our storm sewer, things like that. Um, right now, uh, we do have a criteria manual that standardizes how we should um, do everything with assumptions, um, you know, uh, values of certain things. Um, this way, we could actually have all of them uh, working together. Uh, right now, our, most of the drainage basin design plans, they're from about 2000 on earlier. Um, they have kind of seen their time, computer technology has come a long way, software technology has come a long way. It'd be a nice way to integrate everything and kind of update everything so everything's all in the same playing field. We're not having to kind of estimate one thing and then go to another. Um, the last part I'd like to touch base on is uh, to basically create a citywide model that incorporates all the drainage basins um, together. Uh, we see this with um, the water infrastructure that we have right now at the city. There is a computer model of all the water system for Rapid City. Uh, we could potentially do that with all of the drainage um, uh, cells, all the infrastructure that we have together. So you actually see what happens when all these drainages uh, eventually hit Rapid Creek. And then you kind of see how everything works together because the biggest thing you don't want to do is have a lot of these drainage cells end up dumping in right at the same point. You want to mitigate how much water is actually coming downstream. Um, this is um, the picture of all the drainage basins um, that are through Rapid City. And you see all of them go along. I have a highlighted Rapid Creek here. Basically, all of them fly into uh, to Rapid Creek here. And like I kind of pointed out, is it'd be kind of nice to conglomerate them all together, kind of see how they work together. Uh, the nice part about uh, putting them together is you could actually uh, do what-if analysis. For instance, if there's a major area over here, for instance, that gets a rezone from residential to commercial, you could right away see what that does downstream and how it affects everybody else. And with that, I'd like to uh, give it back here to uh, Kale to kind of uh, end here on a little of his final thoughts on the Mead Hawthorne drainage. 
Yeah, thanks. And I won't take up much more of your time. And thanks for the presentation, Paul. Um, I think the, the biggest takeaway we've got from it is that, um, you know, the next step, hopefully, is going to be to shoot this storm sewer, you know, for under Elm, down Fair Lane, and set the junction box that Paul alluded to. What it's going to do is it's going to take a lot of our storm sewer that leaves the hospital detention cell, winds up on Fair Lane, where we have significant flooding problems, get that combined up and routed to the detention cell so that we can take advantage of the investment that was made in creating the detention cell, get the water off of Fairlane Drive and off of Fairmont, get it underground in the ponds, utilize the two impact basins that aren't gonna have a lot of water in them until we get the water, until we get the storm sewer pushed across uh, uh, down Fairlane. That and I, you know, I, I personally love the idea of a dynamic model in, in our detention cells, much like Paul alluded to, when you have a water system model, you model the whole town. So when you do something over here, you can see what it does to the rest of the town. Um, our drainage basin plans are kind of, they're set alone. So there's no way to, to determine if I make a modification over here, what, what actually is happening around the rest of the basin. So that would be, that'd be a wish list item right there. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to stick around. Otherwise, uh, let's turn it back over to Dale. Chair recognizes Lisa Modrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start with uh, making a motion to acknowledge Second. the thank you and retain the floor. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the presentation's not quite finished. I've got another component to it. Oh, but, you do? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, we right. can keep going. Did you going. bring lunch? <laughs> I did not. I'm sorry. I, I, I warned you that it was going to be lengthy, so. Thank you. I, I'll yield to Dale and then come back. All right. Thank I, you. I, yeah, I get it. I really like to thank uh, Paul and Kale for taking their time today to, to present this information. Very good stuff. Uh, goes to show you that uh, with today's technology and updated computer modeling, and uh, it's really easy to see what the effects of this are. Okay, funding. That was one of the items, second to the last item that I was going to talk about today. Uh, how how do Drainage projects get funded in City Rapid City. Well, the stormwater drainage utility fee. Uh, it was initiated in October 2013. Our annual funding is about $2.4 million annually, of, what, of which $1 million goes to maintaining our existing drainage infrastructure. Uh, and then $1.4 million is earmarked every year for building new or updating uh, antiquated drainage facilities. This is very similar in the way we manage our roadways too. We have to keep our good roads good. So we are spending maintenance dollars every year on our roads to keep good roads in good shape instead of just walking away from them for years and years and years. And quite frankly, that's what happened with our drainage system over the last 30 years. Uh, there was no maintenance dollars being uh, put into them unless it was an emergency. So the stormwater drainage utility uh, fee that was uh, implemented in 2013 has done amazing things. And I'll, I've got some slides a little later that'll illustrate all the work that's been done with it. Um, our annual fee, I'm not going to get into this. This is how the fee is, is computed. Uh, just a couple of things I'll note in red, the average fee that a citizen of Rapid City pays is about $35 a year. Uh, and our, our fee is about half of what Sioux Falls is. Sioux Falls, when they implemented their fee, has an annual inflation uh, amount that automatically kicks in. So their fee is continually going up to try to match uh, inflation. Where our, our fee that was implemented in 2013 has not changed. Uh, here's a list of some of the major projects that have occurred with the stormwater drainage utility uh, funding since uh, its inception and since we started collecting the money in 2015. So I won't get into any specifics, but here's a long list of things that have already been done. Uh, back to the maintenance portion, here are statistics of what uh, our maintenance crews have done. They have jetted uh, 52,000 lineal feet of pipe, uh, that's underground stormwater pipe, televised about the same amount to check condition to see if there are any um, critical things that need to be fixed. Uh, drainage ditch cleaning, 864,000 square feet, uh, about a million square feet of channel cleaned. 
we've had some projects where we've actually cleaned out some ponds, uh, mucked out the excess uh, material in ponds, and, and also worked on just regular complaints that they receive every day. Uh, here I'm just going to blow through these really quickly. Here are some examples of an overgrown detention pond that was built many years ago that had been neglected and then a uh, picture on the right shows it being cleaned up and soil stabilized and getting it back to the functionality that it was originally designed for. Uh, East Chicago same thing. This one probably been neglected for even longer than that. Uh, this is a uh, overgrown and not very effective for conveying stormwater flows. Uh, Willow Park on the west side of town, uh, once again got it cleaned up. Uh, the Mead Channel, I've done a lot of work down in there. Uh, it was built back in the 70s and so uh, a lot of work's been done in there. In fact we've been in there most recently again after this flood event to clean out a lot of the debris. Uh, landscape rock along boulevards, along roads that people put out there, it looks nice, but if you get water that's going down the road that overtops the curb, it's going to carry that rock with it, and then it ends up depositing it in uh, some sort of drown, downstream facility, be it a pond or a ditch. So uh, This was a pipe over uh, in the Sioux Park area that had been silted in. You can see that black silty gunk that's built up in the pipe. Uh, been neglected for many, many years. Uh, uh, with our stormwater funding, uh, we were able to get that cleaned out to, to help that flow properly. Uh, Dover Ditch, uh, once again, West Rapid, uh, area that wasn't developed with much drainage in consideration. So uh, protect your property. Uh, a lot of people call and say, hey, I've got a problem. What, what can I do? Well best thing you can do is make sure you make efforts to protect your own property. Uh, that can be simple things like making sure you're, you have positive drainage away from your foundations. Make sure your, uh, your downspout extensions uh, shed water away from your home. Uh, also, you should keep in mind your neighbor, too. Uh, by building berms and dikes and pushing it on your neighbor is not necessarily a good thing to do. It may protect your property, but you've got to be cognizant to of what you're doing to your adjoining properties. Flood insurance is another way to, it doesn't protect your property, but it's another way to uh, help you if you have problems. Uh, floods are the leading natural disaster in the United States. I alluded to just a few that have happened this past week in the United States and internationally. Uh, there was a flood in Maryland back in late May. In fact, it was the uh, May 27th that uh, was significant. It had unprecedented uh, uh, flows in the Baltimore area that they'd never seen before. So flooding can happen anywhere at any time. Um, I guess the, the third bullet point is the, the thing that I want you to take away. It's that 20 percent of flood claims come from properties outside FEMA designated floodplains. What that means is you can, anybody that owns property can obtain flood insurance. It doesn't have to be in a FEMA regulated floodplain. It can be on top of a hill. It can be anywhere. Uh, and there's advantages to that. City is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which means um, we abide by all the FEMA regulations. And then we also have to manage internally uh, in our corporate limits the floodplains that we have properly. Um, so an effort to do that, we have floodplain development permits. When people are doing developments, they're required to make sure that their floodplain management is correct and in compliance with FEMA requirements. If they are developing in a floodplain, there are certain requirements that have to be met for that. Um, so as part of that, there's a thing called the community rating system. Since we're members of the National Flood Insurance Program, based on how the city performs with our floodplain management, uh, our people in town that have a flood insurance policy can get a discount. The City of Rhapsody has done an outstanding job over the years. So we have a class seven rating, which means that there's a premium discount of 15%. That is significant. And that's due to the efforts that this community has made in managing our floodplains uh, since we became a member of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, everyone lives in a flood zone. Zones are used to determine policy rates. 
Obviously, Zone A and Zone E are AE are high risk. That's where flooding can be expected when it rains. Uh, those are what people call the hundred-year floods that you see. Uh, we've we've shown you a number of them today on the screen. They're typically uh, blue hatched area, which is a hundred hundred-year uh, risk or a one percent chance. Zone X or moderate to low risk, which there it's pretty much everything located outside of that that area. Um, currently, there's about 200 people that have flood insurance in Rapid City. Only 200, if you can believe that. 35% uh, of them are properties located outside of those floodplain areas. If your property is located in a 100-year floodplain and you do have a federally backed mortgage, or even if your lending institute uh, may require you to carry flood insurance, uh, I should say if you have a federally backed mortgage, you must have flood insurance. If your lending institute doesn't, isn't a federally backed thing, they will likely still require you to carry flood insurance. If you're located in a zone X or out of the 100-year or the regulatory floodplain, you're not required to have flood insurance, but you can, and it comes at a great discount. Uh, a preferred risk policy, uh, national average, is $395 a year for flood insurance outside of the um, zone A or zone A. Uh, renters and condo owners can purchase flood insurance. Uh, you're, you can still purchase flood insurance after you've been flooded. Flood insurance can pay regardless of whether or not there's a presidential disaster declaration. Uh, the city doesn't sell insurance, insurance, independent insurance agents sell insurance. So uh, all of the 200 policies that are in the city are written by local uh, uh, insurance folks here in town. That is the end of the presentation. I must apologize for the length, but certainly a very important topic uh, this year with the high precipitation that we've had, high intensity, low duration, massive runoff that we've seen. It's a very important discussion. I'll take any questions. Chair goes back to Lisa Modrick for some questions. Thank you, Dale. I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the disaster, the federal level. When you hit a 100-year, and we have documented now almost two months later, a 100-year flood has been declared, is there a declaration for any kind of emergency funding for the city of Rapid City or its citizens? I don't believe so. Um, typically, when you have floods, uh, the, the disaster declaration's got to be much bigger than what happened in Rapid City. Certainly, it affected many people, but I don't believe it met the threshold. Um, back to federal requirements there's a thing they have uh, hazard mitigation grants which is a another uh, opportunity for local communities to get grant funding to mitigate uh, flood damage that's concerned typically there has to be damage on properties multiple times for that to even occur so uh, I'm going to say no, that this event that we had is well below the threshold to be declared any sort of an emergency. So I, I find it interesting, the situation that we've got, and I would imagine my fellow council members have got the same thing, but there's hardly a day or two that goes by where somebody's not acknowledging that they've either had damage or it's continuing to run either along their, uh, their streets, along their yards or even into their homes and is that because we've got table rises we've got natural springs that are overflowing what else is it besides the rain event that is causing some of this damage that continues flooding is caused by rainfall plain and simple we've had above average we're 30 percent above average for the year in precipitation I'm guessing roughly so all that water gets into the system. It doesn't go away overnight. Uh, even if we don't have uh, a rain for the next 30 days, we're still going to be see water coming out of the ground in area because we've had so much precipitation saturating soils on hillsides. That water's going to, it's going to take quite a long time for that water to leave the system. So we've had quite a few in the neighborhood of Clark Street in that area, that general area, who have described, and, and we've seen pictures that are just like what we're seeing on Fairlane. 
Has, is there any kind of shift in study also going on with what's happened over there on that side? Well, the, yeah, the, currently the city of Rapid City, if you've driven down Omaha Street, it was reduced to lanes. We are starting at the creek and trying to build infrastructure up into the West Boulevard area that has had nothing since its inception to try to alleviate some of that flooding. So there is no quick and easy solution on Clark Street. That uh, it's gonna take years, if not decades, for any solution to get there. Uh, the, the cause of water on Clark Street was unusually intense rainfall in a short amount of time. And the recommended studies that uh, it looks like is going to come before us at some point soon, I hope, rather than later, how long will those take? Are we talking about a two years of study, a year of study before we could maybe implement? I would anticipate once we define the scope of the study, um, it's going to take about a year from the time we start till the actual end of a uh, final recommendation. And then beyond that, then you've got to find funding to be able to build improvements. Uh, one thing I want to, I guess, key in here a little bit is cost. Mm -hmm. uh, Kale and Paul on, their sc on the screen up here showed costs for that Robbinsdale pond, mm -hmm. $1.6 million. That's a bargain. That's cheap. Oh. You know why it was cheap? Because they're working in undeveloped land. It was park land. They didn't have to tear up streets. They didn't have to relocate other uh, infrastructure. Uh, the solutions that they talk about, about running storm sewer up uh, Fairlane, or in the Robbinsdale area trying to run large diameter uh, drainage uh, facilities up streets, you have to completely obliterate everything that's in that street. And that's why it gets so expensive. So that $1.6 million detention pond project, that was a bargain. That was very uh, effective money spent uh, trying to get things buried under streets for any length of distance becomes very, very expensive. So with the, and if I could ask one more, and then I promise I'll try to shut down here. Okay. All right. Well. So, so with the storm utility fees, because that's one of the heightened sub questions is, well, I pay my fee annually. What is it doing to help me in my property, saving my property or in my streets or my businesses? How do we address that? Sure. The, it's no different than people paying federal income tax. What does that go for? Well, it doesn't go to help you individually. It goes to fund everything collectively. That's uh, I spoke about all of this, this maintenance that's been done and, and, con and, and needs to continue to be performed forever. Well, the cause of all that water is running off of people's private properties all around town. That's the reason for the fee, the $35 on a residential property. Uh, that's to help pay to, to keep it functioning properly and to build some capital improvements. Uh, at the funding level we have, it's going to take many, many, many decades to make huge differences in the town. We can make a little bit of difference every year but it's going to take uh, many, many years to, to make large differences. It seems like perhaps May 18th needs to bring that fee structure back before the council, and we need to reanalyze if we don't have any kind of cost of adjustment like Sioux Falls does. And I think that is also where we can start now while we're waiting for studies to come through. It's, you don't have enough money, and, and the community is going to need. Uh, this, is, this is a safety issue as well, so I hope we can get on it as soon as we can because there's a lot of property owners that have huge losses and they haven't recovered and it's been two months and the rains keep coming. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair recognizes Ritchie Nordstrom. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the presenters, every one of you. Uh, I've got, Madam Chair, I've got a long list of items to go through and it, would it be uh, unusual or appropriate or inappropriate to have the rest of these uh, items be brought up to the city council because uh, what I'm looking at here p could possibly take another half an hour of conversation. So I think we're going to have to delay that for the city council meeting. Um, I have a lot of questions myself and maybe we could even research some of these on our own time so that we're not keeping yeah. everyone here. 
I appreciate it. And then, is it possible, Mr. Tech, to uh, attach this presentation as a link to the uh, uh, to the uh, agenda item for Monday night? We'll do our very best. It is very large, uh, very large, 429 megabytes. So we we may have to strip some of the video out. But yeah, we'll we'll do our best to attach what we can. And you know, obviously, primarily what I'm interested in is the CIP portion of it and uh, examination of a lot of things that we need to take a look at. And um, so that's another reason, <laughs> a ton of questions. Um, so if we can have a further discussion on the city council meeting, would that be okay with the rest of the members? And then proceed forward uh, so I want to thank everybody that came in came in this afternoon to, to hear this presentation but yeah I see a question is there anybody I guess yes the Alderman Nordstrom oh, I, hold on a minute what we all raised our hand I didn't know who you were looking at we'll uh, recognize Mr. Tech we, we have to start I'll, I'll just up. say Richie uh, Darla Lisa, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take yours offline, or my door's always hey. open, as you know. It, it might be kind of hard to find me sometimes, but uh, if you have any questions about this, don't hesitate to contact me directly. Is that going to work out for you folks to come in Monday night to hear some more of this presentation? So I'm seeing people nodding head. I just wanted to make my point clear on mine that the Robbinsdale, yep. um, the Robbinsdale development was not the entire point of my statement. Um, I have clients at the Lazy Motel on 8th Street who are not even close to the floodplain, um, as well as clients that were closer but still nowhere near the 100-year floodplain that had damages that we can directly attribute to the Mount Rushmore renovations, not just the flooding and problems that we've had in the Robbinsdale development. So I just want to make that clear if we talk about it Monday that this isn't just about Robbinsdale. Yes, right. Understand. Yep. Because uh, we're uh, at least I'm interested in getting more input from from the public and what they're seeing the uh, uh, information that they have readily available as well. Uh, they're, you know, and primarily just to hear what the concerns are, uh, because uh, the anecdotal uh, uh, fixes that I've heard they aren't going to work. Um, so the uh, what I would like to see is the uh, a little. A little bit more discussion into this and where the funding is going to come from and how this is going to get uh, f funded for the future and how long it's going to take so if we get a, a, a one-year study for example of the of the entire area of rapid city and all the drainage basins that's involved it's going to be a complicated process and then um, then it ultimately boils down to uh, you're my neighbors, and I have to I want to do the best I can for you folks as well to, to help help mitigate any kind of a situation as as well. So it's just going to take a long time to get this digested, processed, because there's a lot of information that I need to re review again. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll yield. Thank you. I just have a few comments I'd like to make to uh, in as we close here. Um, I have been hearing from constituents please do something, you need to do something. And I think by this presentation, you can see that we've been doing a lot. You know, it's been um, a constant um, battle with Mother Nature. It's something that we can't really predict very well. We can try, and we can try to mitigate the damage, but overall, we've been doing what we can. Uh, we can't solve all the problems, and what will happen is if we try to, it'll cost the constituents of the city a lot of money because that's where it's going to come from. So if, if that's what you'd like to see, and uh, we know what happened with the last drainage fees, oh my goodness, we were inundated with calls and, and complaints about those things. But that's, that's what happens if we want to solve this problem and it won't solve everything. There's some personal liability here on everybody's part. You have to look at your insurance. You know, if you can get insurance, you're not in the floodplain, it's less than $400 a year. You have to take some personal responsibility for that. Landscaping can also help, so you need to take some responsibility for that as well. And also, um, for Mr. Horsley to say that it's the Mount Rushmore project, um, I'd really like to see some, some facts and figures to back that up. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying I don't know how we we can really um, say that is true without just hearsay type of evidence so I understand that there's been changes 
as you um, you know uh, understand it since that project has been completed. But to actually say that that was, I'm just going to finish up here. Well, maybe my, by Monday you can have something together to show us why you would say something like that. That's a pretty strong statement, you know, so. I will not be able to attend Monday as I'll be out of town, but I will be here at the following one, and I oh. can show you pictures of what I mean. Okay, okay. Well, we're just looking at fee structures here too. You know, so, so that's what, when, when I'm, I'm listening to what's going on here, and when I'm listening to what needs to be done, you know, it, it um, impacts your fee structures and what will be done in the future. And as you can see, we've been working on this for a very, very long time because as you can see, Rapid City is built in a drainage basin for the most part, and we are going to continue to have to, to um, battle this problem. And um, I've lived here all my life. And I've seen this, I saw the 62 flood, I saw the 72 flood, I've seen the floods since then. And it's something that we just have to try and mitigate as best we can as a city. But I think as far as like um, quick fixes now, insurance and, and um, responsibility for your property. So um, with that, I, 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 I just had a question about, um, you hold on a minute. Um, Jess, are you gonna be here on Monday? We're going to just hold questions and, and, until Monday. If you want to talk to Richie about this, I, this meeting has gone on a very, very long time, and um, uh, we have to get going. So uh, we will uh, handle that question at, at, on Monday night. So right now, I need a motion to. Um, we we did it. Clear a motion. Uh, well, we we have a motion to acknowledge. We do. Yes. Okay. All in favor of acknowledging this report, aye. say aye. aye. Uh, all, all opposed. Uh, we, we acknowledge the stormwater management and flood report from Move yep. to adjourn, Move to adjourn by <laughs> Richie Nordstrom, second by Modric. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>